Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru said this British India Act is a charter of slavery and we Indians have nothing to do with it. Unfortunately, that very act is what is constituting the government of India today. Okay, so this is an act which is an act of British Parliament and that is passed in British Parliament. There is no Indian representative involved in it whatsoever. There's a few things to, to also remember about the constitution is firstly the framer or the drafter of it is Sir Benegal Rao. Secondly, the constitute assembly itself is not a body which is elected in independent India. And of course, the constitution is never ratified by the people of free India. Right? There is no referendum on the constitution that says, uh, you know, do you ratify, do you, the people of India, agree that this constitution shall happen? Again, as I said, it's not by elected people of, the, of free India either. But we start with we, the people of India. So, this topic I've been playing with for a while, which is India as a colonial state. So, a lot of times we have this idea that in 1947 we got independence. But if we look at the institutions of the state, they are exactly the same as they were before we got independence. So, the real question I'm asking is, are we independent and in what ways are we still a colonial state? And I'm glad uh, uh, we have some people from the bureaucracy and many other different uh, areas. Uh, Shri Mani has written an excellent book also. Welcome, welcome his as well. So to get a little bit of perspective, and I also shared this a lot of these times. Uh, in fact, um, Sir here was asking, you know, how do I do the research and what is the uh, what is the way that one gets to write or research a topic? I find the primary uh, uh, field of research is m tapping into one's own experience. In fact, um, Bala Gangandhar, who I'm, um, I regard as one of my really uh, inspiring teachers, he's the person who's in Belgium who's written uh, Heathen and His Blindness. He says colonialism is, uh, is immoral because it robs us from accessing our own experience. It robs us from accessing our own experience. So our experience itself gets mediated by what the colonial gaze is. And this is what I find all over India that, that, that you know, we are, um, uh, that is the sort of mediator. You know, when we talk about caste, it's like the theory of caste that's handed down to us. We talk about social problems. Again, it's the gaze that is handed down to us and we use that gaze to look at society. So. I think the, the biggest um, place for, uh, for understanding is actually to, to excavate our own experience. So I will start by talking about my own experience. I have lived about half the time in America and half the time in India. So it is a really nice way to study two cultures, two societies and uh, two systems. And I have been even in the US, I have been very, uh, I have been kind of pushing the edge of um, understanding society in terms of what I'm experiencing. I'm not uh, restricted myself to a very small circle. Uh, I actually teach, for instance, in the prison system. I teach the Art of Living course. So I get to meet people who are in prison and interact with them and hear their stories, hear their life stories. What are their experiences? So many, many different uh, range of experience through uh, interactions, through my job, through relationships. Uh, have been part of the journey. So, uh, I'll tell you one experience that happened to me in the US. Passport mera kho gaya, Indian passport mera kho gaya. So, I called Indian embassy and call said, you need a police report. Mm -hmm. So, in India, I was like, this is police report. Ka hota. So, I was like, this is, this is going to be a big hassle, police report. So, I call up the Redmond Police Department um, and um, this is some hotline number or whatever, I call them. And I say this thing, I don't even know, maybe it's even in my house, I'm not able to find my passport, but the embassy says to get a duplicate one, I need a police report. And they say, no problem, sir. And within 10 minutes, there was a police car at my door. He came in, he says, what, what's the thing? He writes a report and he gives it to me, done. <laughs> okay. So this was a very dramatically different experience from the experience I had of dealing with the police in India. So, then I started to say, okay, why is it that the experience is so different? Because it is, only, it is the British only that set up the system in the US. 
because a lot of the people who came initially were the the English colonies were there, and the same English people set set up the system here. So why is it that the experience of a customer service in relationship to the government is so different? And I'll give you the 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 other example. There is there was a lathi charge at a cricket match in Faridabad. and uh, many people were hurt and it was uh, there was some uh, error had been done by the system uh, themselves some duplicate tickets had been issued so there was people who were protesting and then the police did a very violent lathi charge and then the later on the police statement came that the people needed to be taught discipline so what kind of state thinks that his job is to teach people lessons is to teach people discipline is to fix the people and this i find is the basic difference between a colonial state and a non colonial state normally you'd say the we elect the government or we select the government and the idea is that these are people's representative at least that's the 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 fib or that's the the figment right these are people's representative people representative means that it should be their job to represent us to represent our problems to represent our issues but the colonial state doesn't think that it's representing the people the colonial thing is job is to fix the people hmm? and that is is what i see is the is the basic difference between the the colonial state and and one which is not organized around that line so um you know this is just a brief thing about how this is U.S. population in 1790. Um, uh, the second column will actually show the number of people based on the origin of the country they came from. As you see, 2.1 million out of this is is people who came from England, and out of the remaining, the majority are actually slaves who didn't have any uh, any say in the matter. So essentially, this is a slab. It's also talking about English common law. It's establishing English common law in the territories. and they are also considered a british colony they get their independence in 1776 and they are having a you know a, a revolt uh, so so in some senses it is very similar but then you look at english common law english common law is the law that has accrued over centuries in england based on the customs of the people and based on the sensitivity to what is that the people want right and the same english people go to the to the us and they set up something which is in continuation of that law so what happens in india in india we also say we are following english law in some senses but this is not our law <laughs> it is the law of the english people it is the law that is built on their customs it is a law which is built on their history it has no relationship actually to our history to our customs to our system so it is completely insensitive in fact so if i look at the supreme court of india the little uh, motto that they have in the bottom is the only place in the supreme court where you will find any use of devanagari script this is the the entire voluminous uh, instance of devanagari is all summarized not summarized can entirely contained in that one phrase okay because being in the supreme court of india you cannot use any indian language you can only use english mm. so the question is now when the supreme court uh, gives a judgment we say no no this is the law of the land na we are using phrases like law of the land but of which land is this the law <laughs> it's certainly not the law of the land our of our land in fact it has no relationship to our land right it is something that is a uh, something that has come and has been placed on top of us it does not the its its roots are not in our land it does not look at the 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 history of jurisprudence in our land doesn't look at the history of the traditions in our land it is something that comes from the top and so supreme court of course has been uh, very active in civilizing us brown natives in recent times so i'll decide to start to dig into this so what is this supreme court who are these people because now there's a collegium system collegium means essentially that the supreme court judges will appoint the next generation of supreme court judges so if you take that seriously then you have to look at the origin of it you have to say okay this means that they are following the parampara 
so you have to look at the start of that parampara because that is what is going to keep on being followed. So it turns out that the Supreme Court is established in from the Government of India Act and the, the British India Act of 1935. That is what sets up the Supreme Court. And they say there shall be a federal court consisting of a Chief Justice of India and such number of judges as His Majesty may deem necessary. Okay, so His Majesty has set up this court and has appointed this first set of judges. And now we are saying there is a collegium system where these judges will keep on appointing other judges, which means that the Majesty's law is being enforced and followed and the Majesty's uh, mechanisms of law is being enforced and followed. What kind of judges needed, uh, what kind of qualification was needed? You, you have either to have been five years a judge of a high court in British India or a barrister of England or North Ireland, Ireland of at least 10 years or a member of the faculty of advocates in Scotland for at least 10 years. So this is the criteria by which you would get appointed a judge in the Supreme Court of India. And absolutely nothing changes when 1947 happens. <coughs> All you do is you probably there is a little sign board. Somebody comes and removes that, takes off federal court and puts Supreme Court. And that that is mostly the extent of the changes that happen. Now they say, well, we got a new constitution. Now we have to look at where this constitution came from. So the story of the constitution is unfortunately not any better than the story of the Supreme Court. So uh, let us we'll, we'll dig into it a little bit in the constitution. <clears throat> but it's very important. This this eighteen. Um, sorry, 1935 British India Act. For anybody who's uh, who's really uh, interested in probing the history, I would really recommend we re you read this act, because we realize that mo pretty much all of so-called independent India is being still governed by this act in all the branches of government. Okay, so this is a act which is an act of British Parliament and that is passed in British Parliament, there is no Indian representative involved in it whatsoever. And that is the governing act which is largely governing India. We have some uh, fictions of, you know, of having some constitution, uh, some bill of rights were added and so on and so forth. But, and it's very clear, you know, all of the, the, the when the, the, uh, this roster issue came up in the Supreme Court, you know, who's going to determine the roster, all this is set in this act. This is coming from this uh, 1935 act only. And all proceedings of the federal court shall be in the English language. This is also recently some judge from uh, I think UP came and started to argue in the Supreme Court in Hindi. Mm -hmm. And the, the judge uh, scolded him saying, uh, don't you know this is the Supreme Court of India, you can only talk in English. So imagine the Supreme Court of the land where 90% of the people cannot even argue in their own language. What kind of justice is going to be served? Right? The only justice is going to be served is the justice of the English, uh, which is by the English and for the English. So, and same thing, they also have all the high court details are there. Similarly, in every high court, the proceeding should be in, uh, in English language. And again, same kind of uh, requirement that they must have been a barrister in England or Northern Ireland and so on and so forth, or a member of the civil service. That is what the other requirement. Um, is there in the is for a judge of the high court <coughs> okay so now from high court let's move, move on to the legislature <coughs> if you look at this legislature the situation is not that different even right now the state legislature they are saying there are two chambers of a provincial legislature will be known as the legislative council and legislative assembly this is where our MLAs of today come from member of the legislative assembly and member of MLC and member of the legislative council okay so all of this is set out in the 1935 um, British India Act, which is, again, as I said, there is no Indian involved in the framing of this act. And there is no Indianness involved in the framing of this act. Because the, even later on, we see when even when Indians start getting involved, Indianness is not involved in, in any way. And for, uh, I found this very interesting. There's a little provision for the proclamation of emergency, which is the same provision that was used when emergency was proclaimed in 1975. So again, all of this is set out in the uh, 1935 Act that gets used. <coughs> okay, so what was the response from Indians of that time when this 1935 Act, which as I said, the current 
all the current administration, the state of India is largely based on this act. But then what was the the response in India to this 1935 act by the by the Congress party and others was that this was a charter of slavery. Who who made this quote that this was a charter of slavery? A well recognized figure. So uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru said this British India Act is a charter of slavery and we Indians have nothing to do with it. Unfortunately that very act is what is constituting the government of India today. Now we have to come back to the constitution. Now people might say no, 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 this is not true. The, the British India Act was there but uh, we have a new constitution that the court started in, you know, uh, promulgated and we became a republic in, in 1950 after the constitution was accepted and so on and so forth. So now we have to look at the history of this constitution. Where is this constitution coming from? So if you look at it, who is actually the framer of the constitution? Who, who uh, if you ask any child in India say who, is, who created the constitution, what is the answer? <coughs> Ambedkar. Ambedkar was the chairman of the drafting committee. Hmm? But the most of the work <coughs> was actually done by this one person and his person's name also again we don't even know recently but his name is Sir Benegal Nursing Rao. <clears throat> he is actually the drafter of the Indian constitution. What does that mean? That means that he is actually the one that he had been in the ICS, he had been um, um, uh, an employee of the British uh, government for a long time and he was the one who actually prepared the entire draft document which was the constitution. All the drafting committee did was did some comments, made some changes, suggestions, you know, then there was a constitutional assembly. But he, I would say, is really the writer of the Indian constitution. Hmm? He was later on honored also. So who is he? He is an ICS. He, is a, he was ordered, ordered the companion of the order of the Indian empire. He was knight, knighted in 1938. Why is somebody knighted? Because of loyalty to the British crown. Hmm? And then of course he was, he became the constitutional advisor in 46 and the, and then the in 48 he prepared the initial draft in fact he is the one who traveled to different countries including us and other countries to look at their constitutions and so on and so forth so, yeah so i would say that for all practical purposes he is the drafter of the indian constitution and then of course other people gave their inputs and so on and so forth what does he use again the template he he's he is a long loyal servant of the british empire and he the template mainly comes from the british india act which is what he uses as the core template which is by the way the british india act is the biggest act that the british parliament has ever passed till that date is a 4000 pages act <laughs> which pretty much like governs every single thing um, about india 1935, yeah, did I say, yeah, 1935, the British India Act of 1935 is the longest act part passed by the British Parliament. So, that was meant for their golden sparrow, so they had, it had to be longer. Yes, yes, because, they, you know, they, if some master is going to figure out uh, how to manage the the servants, then a lot of regulation is not needed. To be there. If you compare with the U.S. Constitution, U.S. Constitution is a very small, very small, tiny booklet, okay. Because the, the power more or less is vested in the people, right? You don't need a big framework of, of uh, somebody telling you what to do if, if the people are considered uh, moral and intelligent enough to figure it out for themselves, right? All you need is some guidelines. But when, when you are in a civilizing mission, then you need to specify everything as much as possible. So this Bernagal Narasimha Rao actually um, framed it and then there is another quote that you might be familiar for, with who is saying I, I am quite prepared to say I shall be the first person to burn it out and do not want it it does not suit anybody this is a quote about the constitution by another well known figure <coughs> so um, of course I think um, to be fair we have to look at that in a little bit of a nuance he is talking about a particular uh, you know in a particular context, he's speaking about that, and later also. All, but in any case, it is, it is a. Uh, there's a few things to to also remember about the constitution, is firstly the framer or the drafter of it is Sir Benegal Rao. Secondly, the constitute assembly itself is not a body which is elected in independent India. Right, the constitution assembly itself 
comes from an election that is happening pre-British India in terms of who were the representatives. And then after partition, they kind of sorted them out and say, ye representative India ke ho gaye, ye Pakistan ke ho gaye. So the Constitutional Assembly itself is a colonial institution coming from pre-partition India. The drafter is clearly taking on the colonial act. But then we start with, and of course the constitution is never ratified by the people of free India. Right? There is no referendum on the constitution that says, uh, you know, do you ratify, do you, the people of India agree that this constitution shall happen. Again, as I said, it's not by elected people of, the, of free India either. But we start with we the people of India. Now, how did we the people of India come in this matter? It has nothing to do with the people of India. Uh, we should, in fact, we should say, we the colonized elite who have been hereby subservient to the British Empire, now, <laughs> now deem to put this uh, structure on the Indian people. I mean, that would be a fair and honest preamble to the constitution. Mm. But that's not now how it is. So now... It's actually a good question. There, it, there are long different histories are there in terms of ratification of the constitution. For instance, um, in, in I think in Brazil, there was an entire referendum uh, for that. Uh, in the United States, it was ratified. See, one of the other things is, a very strange thing happens in India. The Constituent Assembly actually makes the constitution and it also ratifies the constitution, right? <coughs> it is like saying ki homework diya hai kisi ko, hai na? Jo jisne homework kiya hai, wohi usko mark grade bhi karega. <laughs> so, in the US what happens is that the, 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 the framers uh, of the constitution framed it, but then it had to be ratified by each of the states, right? So, each of the states, so the, the, the framers and the people who are ratifying it are different. That means there is some check on the people who are framing it because somebody else is going to ratify it. So you have to make sure it's going to be acceptable to those who are going to ratify it. Right? So this process never happens in India because those two entities are the same, the people who are doing it. <clears throat> and the other thing, of course, you have to remember is like if you look at the French history, they went through several constitutions. They didn't just behead people one time, they beheaded people several times. <laughs> so the first time around, there was a constitution because, you know, the, 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 the royalty was thrown. But then that constitution was not suitable and a few decades later, another, so there's a series of revolutions that take place till they actually get to a constitution that they're satisfied with. So this idea that there is some, this some holy text that has come from above that cannot be changed and now our morality, morality is going to be defined based on constitutional morality is all complete bunkum. Like this is a colonial document, it has come from colonial times, it is imposed on the people of India who have never assented to it. That, that is the, the summary of it. Of course, people say, no, no, they assented to it because later on, you know, there was an amendment to it. That means that you are agreeing to the original document. Therefore, if parliament is amending it, therefore, there is an assent. But I mean, all those, I think, are, are, are stories in a way. But explicitly, <clears throat> I think what happens is there is a small group of elite people. These people have been trained in, in London. They are barristers. They are all kinds of people. They have gotten together. The, some transfer of power has happened and these people have, have get the power and then they frame these documents and the public at mass is really not involved in this process whatsoever um, in any shape or form. <clears throat> so we looked at a few instruments, looked at judiciary, looked at legislature, looked at the constitution and the same thing is true of the history of the academic institutions as well. So the Punjab University is set up in 1882 and um, all these are the British Parampara academics. So our entire academic system is the academic system of the British Parampara. Just like the judiciary is the judiciary of the British Parampara, our academic system is also an academic system of the British Parampara. A very simple example uh, I'll give. So I wrote this book, some people might be aware, called The English Medium Myth. If I look at contemporary India, I would say linguistic, linguistic discrimination which is pushed by the state is probably the most direct and severe discrimination that ordinary people experience in everyday life. Hmm? They experience this in applying for jobs, they experience this in dealing with the government, they experience this in social hierarchy. In fact, recently a girl in Lucknow committed suicide because her seniors were uh, teasing her because she doesn't speak English properly or she doesn't speak it with the right accent, 
Okay. So, if, I, if we look in our own life, linguistic apartheid is what I call it and this linguistic discrimination is pushed directly by the state. The state requires <coughs> the Supreme Court has to be only in English, most high courts have to be in only in English, army interview has to be only in English, the IITs will be only in English, IIMs will be only in English, AIMs will be only in English. People say, no, no, parents want English and the government is thawpar hai. लेकिन वास्तविकता उसकी बिल्कुल विपरीत है सरकार हर अंग में अंग्रेजी थोप रही है हर अंग से अंग्रेजी थोप रही है और लोगों के पास विकल्प ही नहीं है लोगों के चाह और ना ना चाहने का सवाल तो तब आता है ना उनके पास विकल्प हो मेरे पास ऑप्शन हो कि मैं इंजीनियरिंग पढ़ सकूं हिंदी में तब मैं कहूंगा कि कि मैं चाह रहा था लेकिन वो नहीं हुआ लेकिन ऑप्शन ही नहीं है मैं मेडिकल कर ही नहीं सकता हिंदी में मैं इंजीनियरिंग कर ही नहीं सकता हिंदी में एमबीए कर ही नहीं सकता हिंदी में कैट का इंटरेस्ट दे ही नहीं सकता हिंदी में तो या किसी भी और भाषा में हिंदी की भी नहीं बात कर रहा मैं तमिल में भी नहीं दे सकता बंगाली में भी नहीं दे सकता मलयालम में नहीं दे सकता सिर्फ इंग्लिश में दे सकता हूँ सो इट इज कमिंग फ्रॉम दैट सो इन एकेडेमिया व्हेन आई स्टार्टेड राइटिंग द बुक आई थॉट देर वुड बी अ बिकॉज दिस इज सच अ बर्निंग कंटेम्प्रेरी टॉपिक ऑफ वेरी क्लियर स्टेट बेस्ड डिस्क्रिमिनेशन दिस इज नॉट सम हाइपोथेटिकल थिंग ओ मे बी देर इज स्ट्रक्चरल यू नो वी टॉक अबाउट स्ट्रक्चरल डिस्क्रिमिनेशन ऑल दीज थिंग दिस इज नॉट सम Uh, idea or some uh, sort of postmodern thing that there is structural discrimination. By law, we can say in each institution of the government there is clear discrimination. <clears throat> but there is almost no study in academia, or there is very little studies about this discrimination in society or in from the state. Very strange because I mean it's a big social issue, and the, how come people are not studying? Because academia is studying what they had been told to study. They have been told to study caste discrimination. For 100 years, <laughs> so you will even today find that they are studying that same thing, and they keep on studying it because, you know, एक बारी चरखी वो चला दी है और वो उसको wind up toy की तरह वो चलते रह रहे और उसी के ऊपर वो काम कर रहे हैं. So the entire, pretty much all the entire academia university system is following the parampara of the British master. What they were told to study, they study. How the gaze that the masters brought to Indian society. is the gaze that they today look at indian society the, when that when that um, ips officer is saying we i wanted to discipline the people hmm? in fact even in popular conversation you will you'll find constantly find ki the problem are the people il hamare log hi aise hain hamare log hi corrupt hain sab problem logo mein hai <laughs> nobody says that the structure of the the state is colonial it has no relationship to us it's been imposed on us and i'll talk about that a little bit that is the problem that is not not considered the problem problem is the people are sully they are lazy they are stupid they are they are uh, you know uh, corrupt they are immoral you know our our customs are bad our society is bad it's very backward right of all these are the descriptions of society which is the colonial description of society right which is why the masters came to save us from ourselves right <laughs> so they can they can save us from ourselves to save us from our our customs and so on and so forth so <coughs> so the, i wrote an uh, essay a few years ago called is um, um, are indians corrupt <coughs> where is this word corrupt coming from what does it mean for people for when we say the people are corrupt what does that actually mean it's very interesting when the british initially come and they set up their courts they are very surprised that people come in courts and they give a uh, true testimony they say oh i have committed this crime they come and many people are are going straight away to the court and they are admitting even if they have done something wrong they are admitting it they are very surprised because this is not how the english system works right so in the beginning that they are doing this and also the corruption is firstly imply uh, the first use where they start using corruption is actually in relationship to the offices of the east india company Uh, where there is corruption <clears throat> and then the second use is from the missionaries from which point of view of course the uh, the indians are corrupt because they are uh, immoral people because say, they are held in the sway of satan right versus people who have been saved uh, by christianity right so these are the, the kind of in the early places where you look at where corrupt uh, word is coming from this is where it comes from now if you look at what happens today I'll give you a simple example. So let us say, um, a few uh, couple of decades ago, there was a um, fixed telephone lines was the big thing, right? 
So, if there was a problem in your telephone line, then uh, you uh, couldn't get it fixed. So, you called this guy and this guy expected some service charge, which was not in the regular, you know, Suvida Shulk. Bakshish. To fix your telephone line. Okay. <clears throat> so, now the problem is obviously this is corruption because he's, he's, this is not supposed to be done according to law. But if you look at it another way, is this person going to... Is this person going to take your money and run with it or is he going to fix it after he takes your money? Is he going to deliver on that contract of when you pay him the money, is he going to deliver the good? Yes. He's going to deliver it, right? But if he does not you have the right that you are going to scold him. He has not done And he is also going to feel bad. If he is feeling bad because he does not do the work, means he is not an immoral person. Right? He is actually a moral person. So, if he is not an immoral person, then what is the corruption? <clears throat> the corruption is the corruption of the state. What does that mean? The state has created a system by which it does not have any of the characteristics of a healthy functioning system. What are the characteristics of a healthy functioning system? Healthy functioning system has accountability. Healthy functioning system has pay for performance. If somebody does not work, they should not get paid. If somebody does work, they should get paid. Healthy functioning system has customer service, right? If customer is asking something, the colonial system has none of these attributes. So, what, what the Indians done is they have created a parallel system that restores some of the functioning attributes that the colonial system is missing, which includes customer service, right? I am giving this guy, quote, a bribe, but he is going to do my job. It includes reward for performance. This officer who, this worker who doesn't do anything and the worker who does something, there is going to be a differential. Okay? I'm not talking about higher big corruption like scams, uh, you know, this uh, helicopter scam and all these defense corruption. Not, I'm talking very ordinary situation, very ordinary people. So, the ordinary people have created a parallel system which is a functioning system for them just to get around this colonial system which does not work for them, does not work for them in any way whatsoever. <clears throat> and the same thing is where this informal economy comes from. <clears throat> now, we keep complaining why is India having such a big informal economy. 80 percent of the employment today is being generated in the informal economy. <clears throat> now, what is this informal economy? Informal economy exists by somehow avoiding the colonial state as much as possible because the colonial state is very difficult to deal with. Registering a company is a nightmare. I have gone through it in the last couple of years, started Garuda Prakashan and just you know since I started did startups in the US, I got a very good sense of what does it take to do a startup in the US versus what it takes to do in India. And this is despite the government's effort to so-called ease of business and all this stuff, it is still a nightmare in comparison. Um, so, what is this? So, and this is me who is like a elite member of society who is an English speaking member of society and I find it like I have to bang my head against walls, stupid requirements, bijli ka bill le kar aao, ye karo, wo karo, dikhao ki jo jaha tumhara, tumhara location hai company ka, us wo premises ka, wo contract le ke aao, submit karo, rental contract karo, kya sab zarurat hai? In the US I can literally go online, get a certificate of incorporation in like within an hour I, I have it, next day I can open a bank account, just take the number there, it's done. Nothing of this is involved. So, what is the informal economy? Informal economy is the economy that tries to avoid the state as much as possible. Right? So, this, this mandi can exist or mandi can there be state a gaya, lekin some, uh, you know, the, st uh, the roadside vendor can exist, usne kahi se goods le liya hai, wo roadside ke upar aake bech raha hai. Hai na? Koi kisi ke ghar mein jaake kaam kar leta hai, uske liye koi paperwork ki zarurat nahi hai, koi employment contract ki zarurat nahi hai, koi angrezi samajhne ki zarurat nahi hai, aap jaake kisi ka kaam kar lo, aapko paise mil jate hai. So, 80 percent of the economy is existing like that. 80 percent of the employment is existing like that. <clears throat> and it is a direct effect of the colonial state. And now you say, no, no, we are going to drag everybody into the formal economy, but you are not going to fix the colonial state. So, like for instance, GST is trying to do. Right? You, 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 you have created this system and GST is only, you, have, you say, no, no, we have IT enabled it, so it has become very easy. So, of course, now the roadside vendor is going to be IT enabled and they are going to do all this using IT, English only IT by the way, GST only operates in English, right. So, and then you are saying, no, 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 we are making a lot of progress, we are bringing people into the formal economy. 
unless you dismantle the 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 colonial state trying to put people in the formal economy is actually oppressing them even more because the only reason they are in the informal economy is this 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 is uh, you cannot deal with it you cannot deal with the court system you cannot deal with the administration you cannot deal with the police you cannot deal with any of these arms of the state as a as an ordinary person in india right it is a oppressive system so we cannot really uh, say that we want to uh, to uh, you know Uh, create a system which is going to function for the people, bring people into the formal. Or some people, I you know, I was tweeting about this. Said, no, no, no. I know this businessman. He's selling pakoras and he's he's got a big house. You know, so he's not paying any tax. I'm a I'm an empl- uh, salaried person. I'm paying tax. But I mean, the fact of the matter is, I was talking about CSA in Haryana. He said that a village came to me, a man came to me, and his one crore is more than that. There is turnover in the village. Someone produces it. He spent one week trying to register his company. वो कह रहे वो फॉर्म ही नहीं समझ आ रहे वो सारे फॉर्म इंग्लिश में है उसकी रिक्वायरमेंट उसके बाय लॉज बनाओ उसका ये करो वो कह रहे वन आफ्टर वन वीक टेन डेज ही स्पेंट इट इन गुड़गांव देन ही गेव अपज लाइक मेरा चल रहा है मैं चलते रहूंगा सो नाउ यू से नो नो वी आर गोइंग टू दिस इज ऑल ब्लैक मनी वी आर गोइंग टू टेक इनफैक्ट वर आई से इज the black money by the business community to some extent especially during british time and, and since we know this is a con- continuation of it is to say the state is not mine i do not want to give the state tax because the state is not mine it does not function for me hmm? so this idea that this is a moral responsibility to pay tax to an immoral state is is a problem so the, the we cannot uh, if you try to fix it simply by looking at the enforcement problem then we are missing out the fact that the that the state is not servicing my needs so the much more the idea should be the, around the state servicing needs rather than the state imposing requirements on me <clears throat> and one of the most important aspect of that and now we will start i don't have too much time here to talk about solutions but one of the most important solutions is radical decentralization of the state <clears throat> and again i'll give you an example from the us <clears throat> I I was starting with this example with saying कि वो जो पुलिस का था ऑफिसर वो आया उसने मेरे को रिपोर्ट दे के चला गया नाउ दैट पुलिस ऑफिसर रिपोर्ट्स टू अ सार्जेंट हु रिपोर्ट्स टू द चीफ ऑफ पुलिस हु रिपोर्ट्स टू द मेयर ऑफ रेडमंड दैट इज द एंड ऑफ द चेन ऑफ कमांड देर इज नो स्टेट लेवल पुलिस स्ट्रक्चर देर इज नो हेरार की दैट गोज ऑल द वे अप टू द स्टेट and indian states are so big if you think about the number of people there is no hierarchy like that whatsoever it is in that city the police is there the fire people are there the mayor is there mayor gets selected by the people so the accountability loop is very small i was talking to a senior bureaucrat in rajasthan wo keh ji log kehte hain hamare paas power hai lekin kya pata hai chaprasi ke transfer ke order bhi chief minister se aate hain right what does that mean it means that everything is so highly centralized that you need to for somebody you need to have a pull at that high level to get anything to move you need to create some pull for your transfer because <coughs> the state can transfer you anywhere you know and you can uh, so the the entire structure because it is set up like this because the colonial state needs to centralize power right it is constantly uh, doing that and to me that is a very undemocratic way because the longer the accountability loop the more the corruption is going to be natural because corruption says main tumko paise dunga tum mera kaam kar doge accountability is and delivery is is instantaneous it's right there right but the the bigger the the this loop of accountability the more court corruption is going to happen so the corruption is not an attribute of the morality of the indian people corruption is an attribute of the colonial state where whatever the state touches it corrupts <laughs> yes. whatever the state touches it will corrupt right so similarly when when the private enterprise come in uh, you know so the i was giving this this guy who comes in and fixes your your telephone and of course later on it gets privatized and now now you don't need to gri- give a bribe to the airtel guy <laughs> you know because uh, so did the morality of the people change from from you know the system changed so this is what we have to constantly look at that the problem is systematic same thing happens in education <clears throat> for instance in the us 
the schools there is a school district that manages the schools or the school district in a big city there might be multiple school districts or in very small cities one school district might cover those school district is directly elected by the people right and though they have complete control over education budgets and the budget is also directly coming from the property taxes of the people who are living in that area hmm. <clears throat> again there is no state level bureaucracy there is no are iska transfer yahan se gaon mein kar diya wahan se ye kar diya nothing like that agar gaon ka school hai to usi ke around that the people will elect <clears throat> what happens to that is that 95% of the children in the us study in a government school 95% of the children study in a government school and those are the most highly funded and the best schools in fact the only uh, most of the remaining 5% are people who want very religious education so some christian schools are there and those other than that the private schools are very minimal so you have a well functioning public schooling system and the way it works is through ra radical decentralization and very close small accountability loops now the question is who's going to bell the cat is the bureaucracy going to let go of its power are the politicians going to let go of this power of course not right because <clears throat> you can propose the radical decentralization but it's not going to happen till there is enormous awareness and people start to say we need to change the system fundamentally right so that is <clears throat> one very important aspect so one of the other important things is the traditional indian system was also radically decentralized the indian state never had this much power in fact the state today has more power than any indian state ever had whether even in mughal times it didn't have but in the traditional hindu kings they had never had this much power the power was always with you know the 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 village communities the jati communities the jan sabha so many different levels of power and some little bit of power is delegated to the king to get tum ye tum manage kar lo but even land records are being maintained through private entities there is a jati that maintains land record and because their entire profession depends on their integrity therefore high integrity is is ensured in the maintenance of land record so <clears throat> india has never been a big government state so it's not a borrowed idea like you know sort of right and left of the us where they are arguing for small government or big government we are saying look at how traditional indian systems work they were much more rooted in the soil and they were much more functionally efficient <clears throat> so so far i have been it's interesting you know um, uh, my my daughter actually is here kanupriya from the us and one time uh, you know i've i've been um, uh, critiquing a lot of times i i i've uh, i criticize the west and people know of my work then they know you know i i i have many good things to say about indian society <clears throat> so sometimes they ask you have you written an article about the the good things in 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 american uh, in an american system <clears throat> so in some senses you know this art, so far my talk is is about that is about about how well functioning from a system point of view from the government point of view the <clears throat> the us system is and as i said ironically it's the same english people who established it there but that was for themselves here it was to rule over over the natives <clears throat> but then we have to see the flip side so what is the strength of indian society right clearly the 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 the, the colonial state is a weakness it is not a strength it is a problem the strength of of india is the exact opposite is what the colonial state wants to fix the colonial state wants to fix society but society is our strength <laughs> our civilization our culture our society is the strength this is what the colonial state wants to fix and the colonial state is the problem <laughs> so rather than the colonial state civilizing the natives it's time that the natives start civilizing the colonial state you know we have to fix that <clears throat> so, so for instance if i look at society from an american point of view and i've studied society quite a bit there still the indian society has a enormous stance despite all the problems that have happened despite colonialism that that american society doesn't you know i was talking to a very close friend of mine in fact i made a video of her later on and she has spent some time in india also and she says that it is so incredible the relationships i experience in india even with strangers and i see the relationships in family where people are supporting each other people are holding each other and i find that this is you know the only relationship that that is there in the us is the romantic relationship and if it's not there then you are you are nobody you know so so you are desperate that you have to be in a romantic relationship otherwise otherwise you really you don't have anybody 
So this is one comment she's made, and and there's a lot of isolation. And you know, as I said, one in six Americans are on psychiatric medication. Imagine a sixth of society is actually taking psychiatric medication. This is the society we are trying to copy, while the state <laughs> we are not fixing. Right? We are doing the exact opposite. The state is trying to make us copy that society. Right? The popular media and academia is trying to say, no, no, we will progress because our society is backward. We need to fix our society. We need to be like them. So that means we need to improve ourselves so that one in six at least are taking psychiatric medication. <laughs> we need to improve ourselves so that I wrote an article is is rape rate a development indicator. Now we've noticed that there's a lot of talk about rape and rape has been incre increasing over the last 20 years. So if it's increasing, is it because quote modernity is increasing or is it because tradition is increasing right obviously we are importing a certain value system so we are not developed we only have um, a rape rate of 1.8 um, versus 27 um, which is the US one so we have to increase it by about 20 times to become a developed country so these are the why don't we look at these as development indicators if we follow that model of development, which is where society is following that, then, then the crime rate has to jump. You know, the number of police per thousand has to jump. US has the maximum number of people in prison in any other country in the world. Almost 1% per percent of the population is in prison. How, so many police has to be kept to keep law and order. How is it functioning? There is quote, no law, there is no police. <clears throat> it is functioning within society. Right? So, what we have is to replicate that society, replicate to state means we have to replicate all those structures <clears throat> into this oppressive colonial state. Right? And then all those social problems and the more the social problems arise, like for instance, rape is increasing, the more we will blame it is because of traditional society. Right? Rather than looking at what is the what is the what is changing <clears throat> because if, if something is increasing you have to look what else is increasing right what else is changing in society that is causing something to happen so <clears throat> some things to look at <clears throat> and then what is the canadian store do it is on a constant job to civilize the natives it never gave up that that agenda and so you know you have the uh, you know Youth, uh, tribal youth in Kerala, in Tamil Nadu, I just read this news item. They are being thrown into jail under the POXO Act for rape. Why? Because a 17-year-old tribal girl married an 18-year-old tribal boy. They have a family. All Both their families approve. They are happily living. But under Indian laws, this is rape. So so what you do is, this, this the, the wife is crying. She has an infant son, but you've taken the husband and you've thrown them into jail. Because NGOs are now found out. Now the NGO system is not only creating these laws, they are making sure they are get enforced also. So they report to the police that this has happened, this marriage has happened. Now you throw them in jail. Right? And this is how we want to fix them. <clears throat> On so all so much energy. Of course, in the US, there are still states where 13 is the age of marriage. And uh, and the the fact is that. That is, and, and the only thing that's required is parental consent. Of course, in India, parents can't consent because parents are backward and they need to be civilized. So, parental consent have, has no value whatsoever, right? Because the state's view of the natives is that we need to fix them and we need to civilize them. And so, it does. I, I would consider this, and this is not just one youth. There are hundreds of youth like this now being put into prison, just for. I mean, they are they are peacefully living in the forest. They have no nothing to do with the colonial state, right? They are following their cousin. Then the colonial state comes and throws them into jail because you violated a law that somebody in Delhi made. Hmm? And <clears throat> similarly, is, I think the Sabri Malay case is also the same thing. Some states uh, court sitting in Delhi does not no, not in touch with the, the the ground has not asked the people what they want. Somebody does a PIL. They might be getting funding from some foreign agency. They do a PIL, and the court issues a diktat. This is we have decreed that this shall happen. Right? There is no, there is no poll, there is no survey, there is no asking the people for what they care about. <coughs> so we really have to ask the question: <coughs> Is this independence? Kya ham swatantra hai? Swatantra ka matlab kya? 
कि हमारा अपना तंत्र स्वयं का तंत्र से ही स्वतंत्रता है तो तंत्र तो हमारा नहीं है है ना तंत्र तो ये पूरा का पूरा पराधीन तंत्र है तो स्वतंत्रता का इसमें कोई एक एक छोटी तरह से भी स्वतंत्रता अभी आई नहीं है तो स्वतंत्रता संग्राम छेड़ने की अब आवश्यकता है है ना एंड दैट इज इंडिपेंडेंस फ्रॉम दिस कलोनियल स्टेट दैट इज अ एक्रीशन इट्स लाइक समबडी सिटिंग ऑन टॉप ऑफ आर एंटायर सिविलाइजेशन अ स्टेट विच इज इन कॉन्फ्लिक्ट विद इट सिविलाइजेशन नॉर्मली अ स्टेट वुड बी अ कंटिन्यूस ऑन कंटिन्यूएशन ऑफ योर आवर सिविलाइजेशन वुड रिप्रेजेंट आवर सिविलाइजेशन वुड रिप्रेजेंट द पीपल बट द स्टेट इज इन फंडामेंटल कॉन्फ्लिक्ट विद इट विद द सिविलाइजेशन एंड दैट इज दैट इज वॉट वी हैव टू चेंज एंड वन वन idea there are many ideas I'm, this time i haven't talked about solutions in this talk one is this right to legislate which you know many countries have in the sense of uh, people's ballot initiatives like in washington state in the in the, in the, in the us i can create a initiative somebody can create an initiative and once you have certain number of signatures that goes on the ballot the entire state uh, people uh, citizens of the state of washington will vote for or against if it gets voted for then the legislator is bound to act on it hmm? so again we are restoring power back to the people same thing happened in india jury trials were taken out jury trials used to happen because anything that would return the power from the institution of the state to the people need to be removed so right to legislate and right to adjudicate has to return back to the people <coughs> and the way the the you know so uh, ballot initiative the referendum why is it the sabrimala issue cannot be decided on a referendum let people decide we know what the answer is going to be right for so many of these things the, so right now you descend into the village you say no no you are oppressing you are doing two teenagers who have gotten married now we are going to throw you in jail so the everywhere the relationship and one of the things that happens is some of the <clears throat> the maoists or even some of the kashmiri issues other things some of them are rebelling against an oppression of the colonial state what they don't realize is the colonial state is oppressing everybody <laughs> it is not that it is just oppressing kashmiris or is just oppressing people in the north east or just oppressing maoists is oppressing everybody because a small select set of people are making the laws and and the discussion happens in a very small elite circle and then it gets passed so the more the rights return to the people the more decentralized we have the those are the directions of the solution of course the solution have to come from everybody thinking about it and figuring it out but but the directionality is that how do we return power back to the people and away from the state uh, which is not our state at all so thank you very much